Hey, welcome to Tape to Tape, powered by Ram, back-to-back -back winner of Motor Trends Truck of the Year. I'm Ryan Dixon. I'm a writer with Sportsnet.ca. Joining me on the other line, as always, is Sportsnet's NHL editor, Rory Borland. Rory, John Tortorella is not going to break down the games, but we are, buddy. <laughs> we are going to talk about the Leafs-Columbus series tied 1-1 heading into game three after a big Leafs win. Wild Canucks also at 1-1 heading into game three on Thursday. And the Calgary Flames now up 2-1 on the Jets heading into the fourth game in that matchup. That's where we want to start. That's why we brought in Sportsnet's Eric Francis to break this all down for us from Edmonton. Eric, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm enjoying this little tournament. I hope you guys are too. <laughs> yeah, what's it been like on the inside? I mean, we've been asking everyone, but um, what are your impressions so far? What are we, uh, you know, a handful of days in? Uh, I never expected to be able to hear uh, what players are saying on the ice. I knew that that was a possibility, but, you know, sitting midway up the rink um, and without any other distractions, it's amazing. Uh, some of the one-liners are very, very clever. Uh, most are, of course, not repeatable, uh, but they're all good for a giggle. It is amazing. It's, I always, I liken it to like watching a softball game. I men's softball game at your, your, your nearest park, and it's just the roar of the bench is the only sound you hear after a goal. It's pretty funny. And then, of course, the goal horn and all that. But no, it's to have some of the best hockey players in the world, basically, we feel like they're playing just for us. I know that's not the case but it feels like they're playing just for us. Uh, it is, it is, I know I'm going to look back at this and say, wow, what an opportunity to be there live. Well, when it comes to chirps, I'm guessing the Jets Flames series might lead the way. This has been a hotly contested series so far. Obviously it started out, um, you know, uh, the, the world was collapsing from the Winnipeg perspective with Mark Shifley going out and the ensuing controversy with Matthew Kachuk, Patrick Laine also on the way out. Um, take us through the first three games of this series and just what the atmosphere has been like around these teams. Well, this, this is a coin toss of a series. I mean, these two teams on paper are so evenly matched and on the ice, it's proven to be that same way. Now the flames kind of flipped a switch in game three uh, early in the second period, they went on a scoring binge. They scored four goals in seven minutes. And from that point on absolutely dominated the jets uh, I would go as far as to say that it was the best effort the Flames have had, the most complete effort all year long. And it really re uh, reminded me of when the Flames, you know, last season won the West in the regular season and had all these high hopes going into the playoffs. But they put it all together. They've got the momentum right now. It's hard to imagine the Jets are going to be able to come back without Shifley, without Line. You know, some of the lesser lights, Mason Appleton's out. It looks like Matthew Perot may be out now. He left the last game uh, with injury. Uh, the, the injuries are mounting, and the depth is really being tested in Winnipeg. But it seems to me uh, that they – I still think that they can keep this, uh, keep this tight and make this a series because they have Connor Hellebuck. I still think uh, the Calgary Flames are not out of the woods yet. Uh, Eric, one of the biggest questions coming in for the Flames was – you know, how that first line was going to perform and a lot of pressure on them. Because if Calgary lost this series, we're probably talking about uh, off-season trade possibilities for Gaudreau and, and anybody really. But, I mean, how have they answered? How, how has Gaudreau specifically, but how has that, that whole trio performed so far? Uh, they've been pretty good. You know, it's funny. I don't think they're Calgary's best line anymore. I think Calgary's top line for the last month of the season and now is uh, – Michael Backlund, Matthew Kachuk, and Andrew Mangiapane. But to answer your question, you know, uh, Goudreau, Monaghan's leading the team right now with four points. Uh, Goudreau's right behind him at three. Uh, you know, they're, they're contributing. Elias Lindholm's had a couple of big, big, big goals. So, you know, no one can criticize that top line. They've, they haven't stood out. They haven't been stellar, but they've been good enough. And uh, even if this series were to end right now, with the performance they've put in right so far – no one could blame them. Yeah, you know, it wouldn't be on them. But uh, all eyes will still be on them moving forward because as the games get more intense and more important, 
uh, that's when we really want to see how those guys react because they haven't reacted well in the past. So tell us a little bit about Matthew Kachuk because a lot of us and certainly a lot of fans just peek in and see he's in the middle of another controversy and someone on the other team wants to rip his head off. And, you know, we all know how definitive Paul Maurice was in terms of his evaluation of the play. Tell us what you thought of the play and, and just a little bit about what you know about this guy being someone who's been around him all the time since the beginning of his Flames career. Well, I'd, I'd say he's one of the smartest hockey players I've ever met in my life in terms of being able to read the temperature of the game, knowing when to turn from their leading scorer. And that's the one thing, no, but, you know, people seem to forget around the league. He's the Flames' leading scorer on a team with Lindholm, Monaghan, Goudreau. I mean, this guy, I, it's funny because people laugh in other cities when he's referred to as an elite hockey player. And I guess we all have different definitions of what an elite hockey player is. But when you're a five-tool hockey player and you can do absolutely anything, to me, that puts you in the elite category and you lead your team in scoring. So there's a guy who knows when his team needs a, a bit of a boost. He's the first guy to go out and just – he won't say anything to anybody. He'll just go out and say – he knows our team's losing momentum. I need to go punch somebody in the face. Or I need to go face wash the biggest guy on their team or do something else with his stick. He's on the line all the time, but uh, I don't think it's very long until he's the next Brad Marchand. I mean, he's already compared to Marchand all the time, but it won't be long before he's amongst lead, leading scorers in the league uh, and, and really considered elite. So I, I, as for the hit, I was stunned, absolutely stunned that Paul Maurice took the tack that he did. I can't tell you how out of line I think he is. It's obviously just a tactic and that's fine. Matthew Kachuk is in all the Winnipeg Jets, he, Jets heads. I think Paul Maurice thought, I'm going to try and get into Matthew Kachuk's head and by stirring this up. That, to me, it's asinine. And I know everybody sees it differently. I'd love to see what you guys think. But I think it's asinine to suggest that at that speed, you know, that he raised his stick in a stabbing motion to kick uh, Shifley. It's unfortunate what happened. We all agree with that. But I think to call it their intent there is, is stunningly misguided. and. Uh, and quite frankly, out of line, I'm, you know, not that the league is going to fine him or anything for comments. We're all entitled to our opinion. But, man, that's, I think that's sickening. You know, he called it sickening. I think it was sickening what Paul Maurice did. Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely gamesmanship, right? I mean, I don't think – I hope we can all agree that NHL players aren't flying around out there thinking, I'm going to stab this guy in the back of the leg with my blade yeah. if this hit doesn't. You know, it was – Two guys going into the boards hard, one of which Kachuk just plays hard, right? And then when Shifley turns at the last moment, they're both kind of losing their balance. And it's just an unfortunate end result. It's like the Muzzin hit yesterday. Like, I don't think anybody thinks Pierre-Luc Dubois was trying to injure the guy. And it's just an unfortunate result. And that's what happens sometimes with a guy like Kachuk who just plays on the edge. It's not that he crossed a line here. It's just he played on an edge. And in this moment and ended up unfortunate for one player yeah i yeah. i guess i'm always naive about these things because or sometimes feel like maybe i'm naive because i'm with you or you don't think people are going out there thinking they're going to injure someone else with their skate now matthew chuck is harder to give the benefit of the doubt than other people but um and and i guess to be fair to maurice i think he did say it not that he targeted him with the skate that he jumped, you know, he didn't say he jumped over the board thinking he was going to do this. It was more in the moment kind of thing, but I don't know. Again, I guess I'll say, I do feel like I'm uh, maybe I'm naive, but I, I just have a hard time believing that's what's going on between a player's ears, knowing the damage you can cause to uh, another guy in your league. And yeah, a friend. And, and, and a friend they work out together with Gary Roberts in the off season you know I, I and and the other thing is just you know in terms of this series the Calgary Flames know that to have any success they have to be physically tougher you know in the last couple of playoffs when they've been bounced easily it's because they're getting shoved around by everybody everyone's dictating the pace of play and the physicality to them the Flames got Milan Lucic with this in their mind we've got to go out and be you know tougher than other teams uh, it's not the old NHL where you had to be the biggest, strongest team and you just manhandle teams all the way to the final. It's a bit of a hybrid. And the Flames, I think, have that. So with that in mind, Matthew Kachuk's going out there early in game one, like everybody on the Flames roster, and hitting everything that moves. 
And he missed that check because Shifley twisted at the last second, but he just caught his feet. And we've seen that happen a million times. It was just unfortunate that he went down. We were all shocked in the building. We could hear him uh, screaming in pain. We knew it was pretty serious right away. Uh, but we were all pretty surprised that he, he folded like that because at first glance, it didn't look that bad. Yeah, that, that makes me think of a question here, Eric, um, in terms of the physicality. Like, that could be an advantage for the Flames in this series because we know the Jets have lost a few pretty big bodies off of last year's roster. Yeah. So, I mean, from what you've seen in Calgary-Winnipeg games in the past, like, how, how different, less physical – um, is, is this Jets team compared to some of the other recent ones? Well, yeah, you lose Truba, you lose Buff Bufflin, uh, and you lose Myers on that, uh, on that back end, and it changes the whole complexion of their team. Uh, Adam Lowry is really the only physically imposing player on, on the Winnipeg Jets. He's like six foot five, six six. Um, after that, um, it's, it's a smallish team. I mean, and – it's funny, the Jets have that reputation of being this big, bad, bruising team. And they were two years ago when they went to the conference final with those guys I just mentioned, but they're gone now. And, you know, Blake Wheeler's a physically imposing guy, but as we saw when Matthew Kachuk fought him, he's not that tough. I mean, Kachuk knocked him out, and Kachuk's not even a fighter. So I, I, they're, they're not that tough. They're playing a physical brand, too. Uh, in game three, they actually would hit the Flames. Um, and and so the hits are close in, in all the games, but it just seems like the Flames – are dishing them out uh, with a little more vigor, if you if you know what I'm saying. They, they've they really made that uh, their priority. And that makes for great hockey to me. And, yeah, it, with that, with that, you know, uh, late in game three, Matthew Perot went down with an injury. Uh, Sam Bennett hit. He, I will admit that as a Calgary uh, reporter, I, I was the first to say, oh, I don't know. That was dangerously close to the boards. Like, it wasn't along the boards. It was, it was in a dangerous position. But – it was, it was a tough call, and they didn't call a penalty on it. But uh, that's the kind of thing. If you throw the body around enough, those injuries are going to happen to your opponents. So we talked about the uh, hits that Winnipeg has sustained on the back end, the losses on the back end. What about the Calgary blue line in light of Travis Hamannick not being there? Who in your mind has had to step up so far and take up those, you know, measure the big-time minutes that, that Hamannick was playing for this team? Has anyone kind of – raise their game a little in your estimation? Well, Rasmus Anderson has stepped up to play uh, Hammonick's minutes and has done just fine, having a very good series. And I think a lot of people uh, who've watched the Flames for a couple of years felt that he was ready to step up anyway. A lot of people think Rasmus Anderson's going to be in the top pairing next year with Mark Giordano, and, and rightly so, uh, once T.J. Brody moves along as a UFA. So uh, the guy who stepped up the most to me, who – uh, to me is the guy that everyone should be talking about on the blue line is Eric Gustafson. You know, the Flames traded for him at the trade deadline with Chicago, and they, they knew he could quarterback the power play, but they had a pretty good defenseman named Mark Giordano who was quarterbacking the power play, the reigning Norris Trophy winner. Uh, but they've since demoted Gio Giordano and put in Gustafson to quarterback the power play. And as you guys have seen, uh, the Flames have scored, uh, what, they got – Two power play goals in game one. They got three yesterday. Um, they're just filling the net because that power play is on fire. And Gustafson's been a huge part of it. So Gustafson's the, the big talking point for me on that on that blue line for the Flames. And how about behind them? How, um, I mean, Cam Talbot was awesome towards the end of the season there. And perhaps unsurprisingly is the game one starter, even though Riddick is the guy under contract next year. Um, I mean, how, how has Talbot performed? Yeah, he's been... Crazy. I had to look at his numbers this morning. He's 202 goals against average, which is pretty darn good in the playoffs, and a 924 save percentage. In game three, when the Flames won 6 2, uh, Talbot had to make 33 saves. The Flames were actually outshot, you know, tells you what that stat means most of the time. I can't remember a big save he had to make. Um, I think that speaks to how good this blue line is, and they're keeping those shots to the perimeter. Uh, but Talbot is just a really quietly efficient goalie. He's not that guy who's going to come up with the Mike Palmatier save that I know I used to try and emulate in every road hockey game I ever played. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it's just, you know, positioning, solid blocking. You know, he's been, uh, he's been stellar. And, and it's interesting you ask because going into this series, A, we didn't know who the Flames goalie was going to be. Uh, I was pretty sure it was going to be Talbot. But B, Everyone was talking about the other guy at the other end, and he's been good too, but not as good as Talbot, and that's the difference in the series. 
So we'll bring this kind of full circle. We started off talking about if, if Calgary lost this series, it was going to lead to some interesting off-season questions. <laughs> Say they win, and now you're into round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and you're up against one of those top four teams. I mean, to end those questions, what do they have to do? Do they have to win that series? Do they have to take it deep? What kind of puts those trade questions to rest? Roy, it's such a good question. I don't know the answer because <laughs> in Calgary, where there's been so little playoff success, you know, this is not even technically the playoffs. This is the qualification round. But, you know, people will consider this a huge victory just to get into the playoffs. And then you could get stonewalled by a juggernaut. Uh, and then, then all the questions come back again. I, I think they've got to at least win one series or push it to seven games against, a, you know, one of the best teams in the NHL, maybe the team that goes on to win the Cup. I don't know, but I think if you, you got to win at least one series, don't you, for anyone to stop talking about your inability to perform when it matters most. Um, and in this series, they've had two games where they've really been phenomenal. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a five-game series. We'll see. I, to answer your question, they got to get to the second round. In most people's eyes around the league, that is really not much of a triumph just to get into the second round. But for the Flames to do it, it'll actually be going to three rounds. I don't know. It, it also depends how those guys, those top guys play in that first and second round. So um, I think all the results from the playoffs were going to mean everything to the future of Goudreau and Monaghan in a normal season. But because this is not normal at all, I think you have to take what happens in the playoffs with a bit of a grain of salt and add it to what you saw in the regular season and make your determination on how to move forward with those guys or not, uh, you know, at the end of the season. You can't just put it on a one or two round playoff run. All right. Well, Jets Flames has been compelling viewing so far. We'll see where it goes from here. Thanks so much for joining us, Eric. Thanks, boys. Love the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Call anytime. I don't have a lot going on here in Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> All will. right. We, will, we are going to take you up on that, buddy. Okay. Stick around, listeners. On the other side of the break, we're going to talk Leafs, Jackets, and Wild Canucks right here on Tape to Tape. Hey, welcome back to Tape to Tape. Before we go any further, Rory, want to let people know they can get their fantasy sports on. Check out sportsnet.ca forward slash Ram to enter. Uh, there are $50,000 on the line in cash prizes. Don't forget to, you can pick your winner in the Ram fantasy pool. Not your winner, sorry. You hope they're the winners. You can pick your players before each round all the way up to the final. So even if make some poor choices early on there is a chance to get back into this thing grand prize winner gets a truck again go to sportsnet.ca forward slash ram i'll tell you who's not happy rory people who picked new york rangers because they gone yeah that didn't take very long did it no uh, they didn't do much they only scored four goals in three games um you know we were really excited to see what igor shesterkin was going to do they heir apparent to Henrik Lundqvist and then he was out for those first two games uh unfit to play and came back and it was just too late um you know when I when I did the bold predictions article on sportsnet.ca they were the team that I picked as here's this year's Cinderella team but really at the top of that set it up as when you do this article you're setting yourself up to fail right because you're really trying to take those deep cuts um that have some basis in reality and the Rangers just looked like a team that were trending in the right direction. They had an offense that was chugging a goalie that looked like, um, you know, he could be one of the best, if not the best in, in the first round. And they swept the Carolina hurricanes 4-0 in the regular season series. So to get swept themselves 3-0 only score four goals. I mean, I didn't see it happening that way. Um, I was nervous of Carolina's goalies. Both of them played in that series, and both of them played really well. Reimer made a spectacular save in, in game three. I, I, you know, Carolina, you know what you're going to get from them every single game, even when they're missing guys like Dougie Hamilton. Like, they're just so well-oiled. Um, they don't have a lot of weaknesses there, and they were just chugging along in that series. You worry about now if, if the layoff for them is going to be a little long, but that could mean they're just going to be rested up. And, and the team that they're going to play in the next round out of that round robin hasn't been playing the, you know, highest no. stakes games and not, not the most physical games either. So maybe it's not as much of a factor right now, but I wouldn't want to play the Carolina Hurricanes coming out of that series because they 
didn't really look like they had any weakness to them. So a little in pod news, we've learned as we're recording here on Wednesday morning in Toronto that Jake Muzzin, who was of course injured late in Toronto's 3-0 win in game two over Columbus, will not return for the first round. So the Leafs will play the rest of their games against Columbus, whether that's two more or three more without Muzzin. What do you think this does for the Leafs defense as we head into the third set our third game of this set between these two teams on Thursday. Well, I mean, it's a huge loss. Um, Muzzin, I mean, there's a reason why they went out and targeted this guy in a trade a year ago, because he's always been like Corsi friendly, defensively responsible. You know, he's not flashy or anything, but he does, he does those steady things that you need to complement the more offensive weapons that you've got on that team. So it's a massive loss and there's nobody that's going to be able to step in and do exactly what he does. But, um, you know, based on who the seventh defenseman has been for the Leafs in, in practices and all along here, it, it seems like Martin Marinson is the guy that is going to get the call here. You wonder if we see Rasmus Sandin at some point as well. But, um, you know, do you get to a point where there's too many rookies? If you're putting Nick Robertson in already, do you want to replace a veteran like uh, Muzzin with a rookie like Sandin? Or do you want someone with a little more experience like Marinson who's no, you know, he's got some liabilities on his own. He's, he's definitely prone to making defensive mistakes. So he's not safe in, 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 in the most secure sense of the word there. There's nobody that's just so obvious. I think there's going to be more minutes for some of the other guys who have played. It's just going to put a strain. Now, the good thing is, is I think they can survive this series without Muzzin because Toronto has actually played pretty well defensively as a unit, um, forwards included. It's just been, how can they find the offense to get through Columbus's suffocating defense? The answer was no in game one. In game two, very much so. I mean, they were going through them like a hot knife through butter, right? And so it's just, that's the key, is can they keep that going? I, I don't think they'll have a problem in Columbus's offense down and having Freddie Anderson uh, hold the fort. Well, yeah, it's funny how much the view can change on a series from one game oh, to yeah. the next because... You watch game one and you go, there's the template. Corpus Allo stands on his head. They get one goal. And then after game two, you're going, well, now Columbus has one goal that went past an actual goalie in two games. And how long can Corpus Allo play like this? Well, exactly. I mean, and you know, if Corpus Allo ever had a bad game, you could easily go to Elvis Merzlikens. And I you could. I think you can say Merzlikens has the higher upside. Um, he, he certainly looked like he might take that job down the stretch. And, you know, had we had more games, maybe he kind of ekes his way into maybe not a finalist for the Calder, but like that fourth guy who was in the running there. Like he was sneaky good this year as a rookie. So they have depth there. But yeah, I mean, who knows what is going to happen in game three? Like Columbus just did not have a very good game two. Toronto did not have a good game one. I really don't know what this means for, for game three. It could go either way completely. I think if you're Toronto, you know, you've, you've seen Austin Matthews had a couple good games. John Tavares had a spectacular game too. But that was, I haven't I've, seen that blow up from Mitch Marner yet. That was a huge goal from Tavares too when they really needed that breathing room, right? Like that was, you get a one crack here, you're all alone. I have a theory that the more room you have on a breakaway, the less likely you are to score. And that was one where he had all kinds of room, but he still put it in. He didn't overthink it. And I think that was obviously a big exhale moment for the Leafs where they were out of the woods in terms of it just being a one goal game. And yeah, those are the guys uh, they need. So, and as John Tortorella said, uh, Columbus sucked. So we'll see yeah. what they can do from here. Um, I'll tell you who didn't suck in their second game. The top line of the Vancouver Canucks, the reunited top line. We talked about Calgary's big guys coming through. Well, that was certainly the case for Vancouver in game two when the Lotto 649 line, JT Miller, Elias Pettersson, and Brock Besser uh, reunited with Tyler Toffoli going out. And suddenly the Canucks are in a 1-1 series. That's now a best of three with Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. I, I mean, coming into this series, I was wondering what is Elias Pettersson going to be able to do? And he's been awesome through two games. He was their best player in game one. And if he wasn't in game two, he was really close to it. I mean, that that top line, ha having Besser back on it, I mean, when you lose when you lose to Foley, 
um, to an injury, it looks like. You know, you wonder what you can do there. But if you can put Brock Besser up from your third line and put him there, I mean, you're you're sitting pretty. There, there's not, not much of a better upgrade than that. And, you know, look at the other guys that they put in here, like Jake Bertanen, Louis Erickson. Like, these guys aren't, uh, you know, going to give you – goals every single game they're not going to be the most consistent but they had pretty decent seasons for what they can bring and you look at Erickson and man that guy must be really motivated too to keep playing and to keep in this lineup and there's a lot of there's a good mix of like veterans but also guys who haven't played playoff games in in that uh, Vancouver locker room and they all seem to be getting off to a good start even the loss wasn't like a horrible effort Minnesota was just kind of they were just a little better in that game, but in in game two, Vancouver, I mean, it's a one goal game at the end of it, but Vancouver was that, that should have been a three or four goal game. They were all clearly a better team in in, in game two, which is, which is huge. And, you know, this was Jacob Markstrom's first Mm -hmm. go at the Stanley cup playoffs after all these years. And you never really know how that's going to go even for a veteran like him, but he's been great too. So I think if you're the Canucks, you came out of game one definitely nervous in a, in a short series. But after game two, you can take a, 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 big, a big breath, feel much better about your game. It, this was going to be a close one from the start. Every, every measure of these two teams, they're really neck and neck. They got there differently. But I think the series is playing out so far as we maybe expected it to. Yeah, Canucks have not surrendered a goal at five on five through two games. So it tells you they are, their goalie's playing pretty well and, and they're playing pretty well in front of them. Any other takeaways from the first half week of Stanley Cup qualifier action? Well, I mean, just to, just to get back to those round robin games again, I mean, everybody's played one. It's so hard to get a read on what's going there. I mean, Boston did not look very good against Philadelphia in their first game, but. You know, I think that's probably just the case of a team that's knowing they this is a long road ahead, and these really aren't games that are going to define anything. They're, you're going to, I would want to avoid playing Carolina if I could, but if you lose these three games, it's not the end of the world. You're going to go into another series. I think it's more important that you stay healthy um, and fresh. Um, in the qualifying round games, I mean, talk about him a lot. Mark Spector wrote a, a really good piece on Connor McDavid's second goal uh, in that game to the rush where he kind of knocks the puck down at center ice with his stick, but does it in a way where he's keeping his momentum going. He's picking up speed as he's knocking it ahead, bumping it ahead, bumping it ahead. And he, he got Wayne Gretzky to talk about it a little bit. It's stick handling guru, guru, Pavel Barber, Dave Tippett um, to t- talk about just how special and how much skill it really goes into a goal like that from when he got the puck at center ice all the way to getting around Mata and, and beating Corey Crawford with just an amazing backhand. How he got that up over his shoulder and under the bar, I, I have no idea. Um, if you haven't read that, if you haven't seen that goal, go check out that article. It's really phenomenal. Um, I mean, he's just really driving the point home that – Connor McDavid is the best player in the world. I mean, we're seeing in the Montreal series too that Sidney Crosby can kind of turn it on, right? Like they needed a game to – they needed to come out strong and he got on the board quickly, right? Mm-hmm. And those big players, they keep proving that they just know when to step it up um, when their team needs it. And in Connor McDavid's latest game, he's second in the NHL in scoring right now. So um, – as worried as you were as an Oilers fan after that game one, you got to feel real confident knowing that you've got McDavid. There's probably a huge game from Leon Draisaitl coming before long too against a Chicago team that just struggles to defend. So um, it's there's no real. The other thing is I was wondering like, is it the experienced teams or is it the young teams? I think we're all wondering this. Who is going to benefit more from this five months off? And it's inconclusive right now. Like it's a split between. If you look at the teams that had the most playoff experience on their rosters versus the teams that had the least, it's basically a split in who's won and who's lost those games so far. So I don't know if that's even really going to be a factor. I think before long, we're just going to settle into, you know, these are the playoffs and it's, it's going to be the same as it is every other year. It's going to be low scoring. I think the penalties will start to fall off 
a little bit more and it's going to be physical. And once we get everybody into a best of seven, I think that's going to become more obvious. Well, by the next time we talk, we will be speaking about the best of sevens and previewing the uh, real draw, I guess, the uh, start of the four round traditional best of seven series, the March to the Stanley cup. We are about halfway through the qualifiers as uh as we talk today and they'll be wrapping up on the weekend. It has been a ton of fun, just hockey all day long. Um, awesome. Pretty, it's pretty awesome. crazy. Make sure you have multiple screens going, make sure you're checking out tape to tape every week and going to sportsnet.ca to see all our coverage of the Stanley cup qualifiers 2020. Thanks so much to my co-host Rory Boylan for showing up today and bringing it as always. You can find them on Twitter at Rory Boylan. Thanks to our Michaels behind the scenes, Michael Myers, our uh, producer, Mike Tassoni, our man who is bringing you this wonderful video feed. Check out my own stuff on sportsnet.ca. You can find me on Twitter at Dixon on sports and come back next week for more glass rattling hockey action on tape to tape.